देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगद्गुरु we were in the third chapter of the bhagavad gita a couple of verses which we did last time let's chant them together i have a few comments on those before we move on this is chapter 3 verse number 17 17 and 18 yastu atmarati re vasyat yastu atmarati re vasyat आत्मतृप्तश्च मानव आत्मतृप्तश्च मानव आत्मन्यव च संतुष्ट आत्मन्यव च संतुष्ट तस्य कार्यं न विद्यते तस्य कार्यं न विद्यते नैव तस्य कृते नार्थो नैव तस्य कृते नार्थो नाकृतेनेहकश्चनाकृतेनेहकश्चनाकृतेनेहकश्चनाकृतेनेहकश्चनाकृतेनेहकश्चनाकृतेनेहकश्चनाकृतेनेहकश्चनाकृतेनेह
our activity, our uh, being scattered in manifold worldly activities reduces to certain service activities. I am working for the welfare of others. I am working as, um, as service in devotion to God. And what about the hundred other things you were involved with earlier? I don't want them anymore. I have nothing really to gain from them. So activity is reduced. In bhakti yoga, my affections were scattered among so many people and things and places and objects in the world and activities in the world. My affections are now pulled back from all of that and focused only on God. Again, you see withdrawal. And it's most evident in Raja Yoga. When my mind was scattered in a thousand things, I used to think about so many things about the world. Wanting something, being anxious about our other things, being fearful about something, hoping about something else, remembering things, about so many things and people and places and activities in the world. That's the mind turned outwards, pravritti. But in Raja Yoga, what happens? The path of meditation, all of that has to be turned inwards. I focus inward. And whatever your method of meditation, whatever your method of meditation, you focus on the Ishta Devata, the chosen ideal. You focus on the, on the visualization of a deity. You focus on the in-breath and the out-breath. Even the witness meditation, let the mind run as it will. There does no, Nobody ever tells you, let the mind run, and run as it will and that's the end of it. No. You are the witness. If you flow away with the mind, then it's not meditation. <laughs> so, whatever form of meditation, it's still withdrawal. Notice then, all spirituality definitely begins with a kind of withdrawal. Kind of stepping back from, whether it's the path of action, path of devotion, path of meditation. But the path of knowledge points out something very vital. Neither action nor inaction, neither pravritti nor nivritti is the reality. The reality is beyond action and inaction. It is beyond pravritti and nivritti. That unattached, pure consciousness, which is alike the witness of all our activities and the witness of our inactivity, which in itself has no connection with activity or inactivity, that pure consciousness is the truth. The way of knowledge tells us that. And that pure consciousness, that Atman, our real self, underlies all our activities, worldly activities and spiritual activities. It underlies all our engagement with the world and withdrawal from the world, all our pravritti and nivritti. In itself, it's neither pravritti nor nivritti. It's always there. That is something to be understood. Pravritti, walking, running, that is moving, action. Sitting down, inaction. Speaking, action. Keeping silent, inaction. Eating, action. Fasting, inaction. <coughs> Waking, there will be action there. Deep sleep, inaction. In all of these cases, this is pravritti and nivritti. The Atman is the same everywhere. That has to be understood. Otherwise, in the path of, uh, in, the in the spiritual path, it's often the attraction of nivritti. In worldliness, pravritti is the attraction. In worldliness, also there is nivritti inactivity. That's called laziness. <laughs> Couch potato. Uh, that is tamasic. Spiritual seekers, genuine spiritual seekers, do try to withdraw from the world, and that's good too. A certain stepping back is necessary. But always to keep in mind. So in all of this, to keep in mind that reality which you are seeking. Call it God. Call it the Atman. Call it the Absolute. Whatever you call it. On the emptiness. The Buddhist emptiness. Clear light of the void. Whatever you call it. Is beyond activity and inactivity. It's beyond both. <laughs> it's only when that pure consciousness, the Atman, becomes identified with the body-mind. Then the two divisions become clear, activity and inactivity. As such for the Atman, there is no activity or inactivity. But when you become identified, when I am identified and I am limited to this body-mind, as we are, as we are identified with this, I think I am this, then clearly there is activity and inactivity. These two divisions become very clear. Notice, 
action and inaction, karma and akarma, pravritti and nivritti, both are actually action. Until we are enlightened, until we realize ourselves as the transcendent consciousness, until that, as long as we think of ourselves as this being, body, mind, thoughts, emotions, then whatever happens is action, is within the realm of action. Eating is action. What about fasting? It's action. You already know too much Vedanta. <laughs> You say, no, fasting is not eating. How can not eating be an action? You're not doing anything. How is it an action? But fasting is an action. It requires effort. It's deliberate. It's consciously done. In Indian languages, suppose Bengali, khachi means eating. It's a verb. Upovash korchi. If you translate, I am doing fasting. Look at the do verb there. Psychologically, if you look at it, even sitting quietly and in meditation, Seems the most inactive thing ever. That's also action. It's taking a lot of effort. <laughs> Especially for restless people. You know? It takes a lot of effort. Apparently nothing is happening. That's also something happening. That's action. I saw this cartoon once. Um, meditation teacher is teaching the st meditation student. The teacher is sitting like this. Student is sitting. The student is looking like this at the, at the teacher. What, what next? And the teacher is also looking at the student. This is it. Nothing happens. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> but that's also action. Action and inaction, both are action. Also, one more thing to be noted. The entire range of action and inaction, including all spiritual practices, up to the highest nirvikalpa samadhi, the entire range is within maya. In Bengali, uh, Sri Ramakrishna used to say Maya Relaka, the area, the kingdom of Maya, the area, it's within the boundaries of Maya. Mm -hmm. Within even Nirvikalpa Samadhi. So why? How do you know? The highest Samadhi is within Maya. Why do you say that? Because it has a beginning and it's an end. You put in a lot of effort to reach that state. Are you always in Nirvikalpa Samadhi? Of course not. Somebody else might be, but I am not. I am working towards it towards a high meditative states. If you're working towards it, it's something that is produced. It's still within action and still within Maya. Only Atman or Brahman, the Absolute, is beyond Maya. So that's another point we have to keep in mind. Another point about action and inaction. This identification of the body with the, um, with the, with the Atman, its identification means only because of um, ignorance. I do not know what I really am, so I think I am this body-mind. This identification is always involved with selfishness. There is an amount, there is some kind of selfish motive always involved in action, in most cases. Something. It could be a gross thing, like let me have, uh, you know, pleasures in the world, fun in the world, or money in the world, or, you know, just a party in the world. That, that could, that's action. There was uh, on New Year's Eve, midnight run. That's action. Yeah. <laughs> That's physical action outside. Or uh, it could be that uh, I am, just let me sit quietly. I want peace of mind. I want peace of mind. That's also a kind of, there's a, there's a selfish motive. For me, it's involved. It's a good motive, but it's still involved in there. A little bit of selfish motive is involved. The person they're talking about here, the enlightened person, has no selfish motive. The moment we realize we are the Atman forever beyond action and inaction, all selfishness disappears. And therefore, therefore, the activity of such a person is unselfish. All the action that originates from um, an enlightened being is unselfish. No, not for the sake of that particular body and mind. Some of it may be natural, feeling hunger, eating. But generally, the action that they deliberately undertake is for the welfare of others, is a blessing to others. That's one, one thing to understand. The verse says, Tasya karyam na vidyate, in 17th, uh, verse number 17. For the person who is enlightened, who, has, who delights in the pure consciousness, 
who is completely centered and stable in the pure consciousness, for that person there is no, it says there is no further duty. Karyam, the word karyam means um, in Sanskrit, kartavya karma, the thing which has to be done. Thing which is our duty to, the duty that we have to perform. For such a person there is no more duty. Who has duty? Who has duty? One sadhu, Ram Sukhdas ji, uh, he put it this way. The, the, uh, the person who has likes and dislikes, I want this, I do not want this. Duty comes in there. It tells you that which of those likes are, uh, are moral, ethical, good. Which of those dislikes are moral, ethical, good and which are not. So we have to filter our likes and dislikes through the prism of morality, through, through the prism of duty. To know what is right and wrong. Likes and dislikes. If you have likes and dislikes, there is duty. If there is a clinging to life, I must remain like this. Then there is duty. If there is fear of death, there is duty. But for this person, this enlightened person, who does not have likes and dislikes, for this person, all of this is either the play of Maya or it is all Brahman. What will you like and what will you dislike? Whom to like and whom to despise? Which condition of life is nice and which condition of life is bad? Because it's all, one may be a tragedy, one may be a comedy, but both are movies. In one sense, you have no preference for the two. It's, one, it's not really true that the tragedy is horrible and the comedy is uh, wonderful. In fact, from an artistic perspective, a particular comedy may be horrible and a particular tragedy might be beautiful, you might say. Because the crucial thing is, both are movies. That's very important. The, re the reality is untouched by them. Then it doesn't matter if it's a tragedy or a comedy. Not in real life though. Real life, look at the words, real life. If real life becomes the Atman, is pure consciousness, then the move, this life becomes a movie. Then you have no more clinging to life. We never think, let the movie go on and on and on forever. That would be horrible. It must come to an end. Even the best one. And you are okay with that. There is no fear of death. The terror, the movie is going to end. No. If, it's all that, if you like it all that much, you can come back for the next show. <laughs> and if you are a Vedantin, you do come back for the next show. There was this uh, cartoon I saw which said, um, an Indian guy talking to an American guy. The American guy says that, look, I'm a born again Christian. And the Indian guy says, well, I'm a born again and again and again and again <laughs> Hindu. <laughs> so you, if you like the show so much, you can come back for it. You can, uh, you can, take a, you can uh, come back for a repeat show the, as, ma as many times as you like. So the enlightened person has neither clinging to life nor fear of death. Death is death of the body. Has no particular likes and dislikes. All is divinity to that person. There is no particular selfish um, motive involved there in the actions of this person. See, in our own body, so Ram Sukhdas Ji was a Vishishtadvaitin. Uh, from that perspective, the divinity is one organic unity. We are all parts of God in Vishishtadvaita Vedanta. So the example he gave is from that perspective. He said, in this body, look at how the organs cooperate with each other. So when you are washing hands, when this hand washes the other hand, there is no question of, I want something from you. There's no question of ego. See, I'm doing so much for you. Mm. No, it's part of the same thing. You have a sense of unity with it. And there is, um, th th there is no ego of the sense that I am doing something. There is no question of asking for something in return. There is no selfishness involved uh, in all of this action. Exactly like that, for the enlightened person, all the activities of, of this particular body and mind is for the welfare of the entire divinity, which is present all around. Whatever they can do, their actions, their words, their thoughts also, they are always well-wishers for everybody. A truth, now you might say, this is an enlightened person, not me. Well, if I am going to be enlightened one day, these are practices for me. That which comes naturally to the enlightened person are practices for me. Long ago, um, in the second chapter when we are studying, there Shankaracharya in one of, one of the places he comments that what is the use, about what is the use of studying about enlightened people? 
One use is whatever are their natural characteristics of enlightened people, what whom I, we might call saints or jivan muktas or bodhisattvas or whatever, those are practices for the rest of us. We try to emulate, we try to be like that. Today, it's not relevant really, but today I was reading a nice article on existentialism, very nicely, a philosopher, a professor. Uh, it's sort of a turning of, of kind of um, change in the wave of thought. This, he's a professional philosopher, and he says um, uh, how this person became a philosopher, an academician. He says he was a boxer and a philosopher, and bad at both. <laughs> so he was very unhappy, he writes in that article, he was very unhappy. And he had decided to kill himself, to commit suicide. And he was sitting in a coffee shop, and on the table there was this book. It's a book by the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard. Soren Kierkegaard? Yeah, he's, a, he's a, like a, the ur-existentialist. Before existentialist, where existentialist, he was an existential that way. Um, so he's a Christian existentialist. So there, when he reads this book, he immediately feels that... Uh, there is some higher purpose in life. It's not little ups and downs of life really don't matter. And that higher purpose is deep within us. It's our own real nature, which we are seeking. So he says he, he actually stole the book. He put it under his turn and he took it and he read the book. And he says it saved his life. And he went back to both boxing and philosophy. <laughs> so now he's a philosophy professor and he's too old to box, but he's a boxing coach also. <laughs> uh, why am I saying this? Okay. In that article, later on, he says, <coughs> in modern thought, it is fashionable, it is the style to be suspicious of everything. It, this starts from Nietzsche. It's called the hermeneutics of suspicion. So you talk about any kind of ideal, unselfishness, enlightenment, spirituality. And the hermeneutics of suspicion is, look closer. There's something else behind it. It's just a mask people are showing to you for anything higher noble the, the idea is to deconstruct it and find something behind it which is almost inevitably nasty and low that is the style and this is uh, the trend of academics all across the modern world now <laughs> many people don't know why they do it because the whole idea often of writing an academics paper uh, academic paper I'm uh, talking about that the humanities um, the whole idea of often writing an academic paper is to expose something, is to show how horrible things are. <laughs> and many people who, are, who have learned this from the professors, they call it, they, it goes under the name of critical thinking. Uh, generally, critical thinking is supposed to, if you show critical thinking shows you something nice and high, then you've made a mistake. You're not academic enough. You have, you have to show it's nasty. Something is nasty there. <laughs> so a person is unselfish, dedicates uh, all his or her life to the baby taking care of the poor or the homeless. Well, dig deeper, find out what happened in that person's childhood. Maybe the person was not a success, a loser at school or something like that, now wants recognition from others and is doing it this way. So really the person is not concerned about the homeless or the poor. Really the person wants recognition from everybody else. Aha, we've got him now. And this philosopher, he says, and the point I'm making is not this. The philosopher who's written this article, I liked it so much. In the end, he says, one, let's deconstruct the deconstructionists. One reason it's so popular to do this is, once I show that behind every noble thing is something ignoble, then it saves me the effort of being noble myself. <laughs> I need not follow any ideal in life. I can go on doing exactly what I please because all ideals are false anyway. And I can show you. Be clever. And he says that's disastrous. This is some, an idealist like Kierkegaard saved my life just by reading a few pages of his book. You can deconstruct that also. But <laughs> all right. Um, Yes, so these are some of the comments I wanted to make about uh, these two verses. Next verse, number 19. Tasma dasakta satatam Tasma dasakta satatam Karyam karma samacharam 
कार्यम कर्मा समाचर असक्त ह्याचरन कर्म असक्त ह्याचरन कर्म परम आपनोति पुरुषा परम आपनोति पुरुषा देयरफॉर ऑलवेज परफॉर्म एक्शन विदाउट अटैचमेंट डू द थिंग व्हिच हैज टू बी डन विदाउट अटैचमेंट अटैचमेंट टू द रिजल्ट्स working thus in an unattached way in a detached way you attain the highest that means perfection enlightenment whatever you call it god realization nirvana whatever you call it in this way if you live if you act in this way this verse actually brings to a a conclusion a topic that was started long ago in the second chapter the famous verse on karma yoga karma karmanye vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana 47th verse that the topic of karma yoga how to tra- transform my day to day actions into uh, spiritual action why do i have to transform my day to day action into spiritual action otherwise there is a sharp division between what is spiritual and what is secular let it be let there be a sharp division it, usually there is so this is the church and this is the state this is secular and this is sacred this is meditation and that's work this is god and that's the world it's good to begin with but it's not a good place to 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 be in as we go on in life why because the demands of the world are so strong you have a job and you have people to take care of um i don't you take care of me but you guys have to go out there and and uh, you you have to do all of this and it leaves so little time and energy for spiritual practice one of my brother monks is is humorous he has a sort of biting sense of humor so uh, he was giving a talk once he used to work with um with the swamis who who help our president and vice presidents who give initiation mantra diksha so when you take initiation there are certain things that you have to answer some uh, like a questionnaire is filled up you have to submit certain uh, details about yourself so one of the questions he said one of the questions when you fill up a form about your mantra initiation is will you be able to do the mantra the japa daily and he says that all all of you you all right yes so boldly sometimes so big it goes out of the line this way and that way it spills over yes i will be able to do it and he says unfortunately that boldness and that confidence disappears after the initiation and after that you come and say you know swami there is so much work there is hardly any time for spiritual practice there is there is time for eating there is time for uh, everything else but there is no time for spiritual practice why there is a reason when i make a division between what is spiritual and what is um, secular the what that which is secular takes up so much time energy and attention that the spiritual part of it diminishes there is not enough time left over there is not enough energy left over and its importance diminishes this world why why is it so because we take this world to be real we are in a position where we take this to be real and what is spiritual is still pretty theoretical it's a matter of what i have read what i have heard what i believe in do you know it to be true that god exists right now do you feel the presence of god and at all times you say no that's difficult but do you know that the world is real yes do you feel the presence of the world yes all the time yes effortlessly yes <laughs> i have to put in a lot of effort to shut the world out the world the world comes in effortlessly if it's the other way around the presence of god is effortless all the time without any effort it's always there then spiritual practice is no problem at all it's automatic but now it's the opposite since now it's the opposite you have to look at what you are doing in the world outside not just you us too i remember one of my brother monks uh, went to the swami sometimes we take a break from ashram work we go off to the mountains to meditate and so on and so forth so one of my brother monks went to the head swami swami i want to go off to the himalayas to meditate i want to do tapasya tapasya means spiritual practice and the swami looked puzzled and what have you been doing here You see, the we answer. Oh, but here there is a school, or a hospital, or a temple, or a store, or a bookstore, or something like that. What's what's playing in my mind? It's work. That's worship. This is work. 
that same division is carried on and it's it's there's nothing to blame it's natural for us we fall into the same trap uh, so many funny memories come from my early monastic days one novice was there brahmachari that means a beginner like i was also a beginner at that time and this person was very simple a village lad but quick to get angry so he was sitting in the he, his duty was to sit in the bookstore and sell the books there they were spiritual books in the ashram he's sitting there and um, these people come visitors and visitors they say lots of things you know so these visitors were standing there in his earshot they didn't know whom they were opening their mouths before <laughs> this <laughs> they said oh these monks also do business you know uh, they are also in in hindi it it sounds worse in hindi are ye sadhu bhi business karta hai and this is the sadhus also are doing business and this brahmachari he was so quick to you know quick temper he said what you saying i am doing business here because for him it's karma yoga spiritual practice you saying i'm i'm here to do business and then he would get furious he would fold his dhoti in half <laughs> and slap his thighs that's that's the traditional indian wrestling stance and then he jumps up on the table <laughs> and these two uh, visitors they're so terrified and uh, they fell at his feet mahatma ji they said oh, oh, oh swami forgive us <laughs> krama ki ji mahatma ji <laughs> so it's 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 not work it's actually supposed to be spiritual practice another monk i know who was a great meditator who was very well known for from very early in the morning evenings he would like sit ramrod straight and still like a statue and meditate for hours on end now in his meditation time in the evening he was given the duty of uh, looking after the children who are studying so the kids are studying and there has to be someone to monitor the whole thing it, it's a school uh, a boarding school we wondered how this monk would react because it's his meditation time so he used to do that that work in his meditation time one day at i still remember so clearly um, we were walking with that monk at at night after food and he said you know and he is senior to me he said you know ishwaru um this work that i'm doing i find it i get the same joy out of it as meditation it's just work for me but he says i get the same feeling out of it as meditation i thought he was exaggerating i mean we all know the theory karma yoga is also supposed to be spiritual work so it's a spiritual practice and suppose you are supposed to be um you get a sublime uh elevated feeling out of it you know your mind becomes calm and quiet i thought he was just giving me the theory but he meant it he actually felt it so work is to be spiritualized my brother monk who went to ask for a break and go off to the himalayas and do spiritual practices quote unquote so he got the scolding of his life the head monk said what have you been doing here so many years if all the spiritual practice is what you do uh, once in the morning and once in the evening half of it you are dozing when you're supposed to be meditating if that's your only spiritual practice and the rest of it is not spiritual practice then you're a vagabond so uh, our activity has to be converted into spiritual practice and that verse 47th verse of second chapter very famous verse karmanye vadikar tells us how to do it karmanye vadikar aste you have the right to the action alone what is right before you thing to be done you have the right to do that ma phaleshu kadachana not to the results thereof our eyes are usually on the results somebody joked for every ethical action we don't want to do the action what we want to get the result and for every unethical action bad action evil action we want to do the action but not get the result of that <laughs> the result of unethical action is pain and suffering and punishment karmanye vadikarasti ma phaleshu kadarshan you have no right to the results the results will come as a as a combination of many factors your work no doubt but your past karma god's grace societal factors many things are behind it you work for the sake of work then the third thing it is said in that verse is ma karma phala hetur bhu do not be motivated into action for for getting things from you out of it your right is to the action not to not to the things which you get out of it and then finally krishna knows our our psychology when we are told these things then he said oh then i won't do anything <laughs> uh, 
if I'm not going to get anything out of it, all right, then I'd, I'd rather relax. So the last part of the verse says, Mate uh, sangastu akarmani, do not be attached to inaction as either. Always work. That same thing has been said here in verse number 19. Tasmad asakta, being detached. Satatam karyam karma samachara, keep on working. What work? Whatever is, is to be done in your life. Whatever is right, whatever is your duty in, uh, in your job, in your community, in your family, what is right? Why don't people do what is right? Only reason is ragadvesha, likes and dis dislikes. Our minds are conditioned to chase after pleasure, to avoid the unpleasant. And so if chasing after pleasure means I have to overstep the bounds of duty, by bounds of morality, I'll do it because I can't resist it. If doing the right thing means it's unpleasant, hard work, boring work, won't do it because it's hard work, boring work, even though it's the thing to do. So the reversal is, doesn't matter what gives me pleasure or does not give me pleasure. What is right, do that. There's so much discussion about this uh, in ethics. There is the teleological theory of ethics. There is the utilitarian theory of ethics. There is... Uh, the ont deontological uh, theory of ethics, all big words, nothing very deep in them, but it might sound scary. I was there for whole course on these subjects only. Um, Professor Amartya Sen, who is a Nobel Prize win uh, winner in economics, he was teaching this at, at Harvard, this, and I was sort of an auditor, I was asked to sit li and listen. Um, there would be other professors, there were three professors at, from Harvard who were teaching this course on ethics. Why should we do what should be done? What should be done? One says, whatever maximizes welfare, whatever maximizes, what is welfare? Satisfaction. Whatever maximizes your satisfaction, do that. So yeah, that means I will do whatever maximizes my happiness. No, no, no. The wrinkle there, the little fine print there is, whatever maximizes the satisfaction of everybody in the community, that you have to do. The utilitarian approach. There's another approach. The deontological approach, which says, not what maximizes utility or satisfaction. Do what is right. Don't do what is wrong. How do you know what is right? That which is your duty, you have to do that. What is our duty? Deontology means duty, to do your duty. How do you know what is your duty? Now that depends. What is the law is your duty. What your religion tells you, whatever you believe in, it, that your religion tells you that's a duty. What your conscience tells you that's the duty. It could differ. Well, these are different approaches to tell us what is right and what is wrong. So what is right, do that. Kartavyam, karyam karma samachara. And that also do it without, uh, without expectation of personal benefit, without an axe to grind. You wouldn't believe the amount of subtle hair-splitting discussions that went on. Oh, I heard a nice quote which I can share with you. You have this phrase, hair-splitting discussion? Very subtle distinctions. So one of the professors there at Harvard this time, he said, um, the finer the hair, the more important it is to split it. <laughs> <laughs> so right and wrong, let me just share. It's sort of tangential, but if I tell the story, I'll remember the story, otherwise I'll forget. <laughs> tangential to this, but it's interesting. So I was in this class this semester, and the discussion was on um, ethics on right and wrong and uh, it's not all that tangential because the, the topic of discussion was the Bhagavad Gita now there is a, a famous uh, experiment in ethics called the trolley problem those of you who have studied uh, um, uh, ethics utilitarianism especially uh, you'll know there's a trolley problem tr this experiment is it's a mental experiment not actually done it would be illegal to do it actually Mental is a thought experiment. The experiment is this. Suppose you're standing and there's a trolley running on rails and it's rushing down out of control and you have a lever. Now you see the way the, way the trolley is rushing, it will go down this path and kill um, 10 people. They don't know that the trolley is rushing towards them. But you have the capacity of changing the track. If you pull the lever, the trolley will go not on this way but on this track. And at the end of this track, five people are standing. They will die. But then 10 people will be saved. What will you do? One might say that, oh, that's pretty easy. I have to do something and save these 10 people, but it just means five people will be killed. 
you can see how it'll be, they can make it finer and finer. Let it be 10 people and nine people here. <laughs> the, and, or you might say, no, my religion, my personal belief forbids me from killing anybody. I don't know what, many things can happen, so I will not touch the, uh, the lever. So different alternatives are possible. They will see what, what is your answer and how do you back up? How do you argue for your answer? So that's what they want to see. So Professor Amartya Sen brought up this. But the, so this is Harvard, right? So very br brilliant ki people. <laughs> the kids, they're not kids, they are, it's, all the, it's a graduate seminar. So whatever the textbook says and whatever the professor says, take it for guaranteed, it's wrong. <laughs> so they will have to say something that's completely different from it. <laughs> Otherwise you can't be there. So this uh, student who was sitting next to me said, neither of them, none of those uh, options are acceptable. Why? No, no, you have to choose one. No, neither of them is ethical. What is ethical? Ethical is to look for a better alternative. See, after all, this is supposed to be applied in real life. In real life, it's not so cut and dried. You, the really ethical person, do you see where he's going? The really ethical person will look for a better alternative, not one of two horrible alternatives. Five percent persons dying, ten persons dying. What sort of uh, ethics is this? Either way, you are a murderer. No, I don't agree. I look for a better alternative. That is the uh, third option, and that, that's what we should look for. So, and uh, the professor Amartya Sen. Remember, he is above 80, but he is very sharp. He understands it, and he agreed. And then he told us the story, which I will share with you. The story is this. It has to do with the Pope. So he said, let me share a story with you. Um, this is many years ago. The Pope, and then he is he's, he's cute that way. He said, not this one. Not the one before him. The one before him, the Polish one, and then somebody had to shout into his ears, Pope John Paul II. Yes, that one. He called me and uh, two other economists from Harvard. One was Kenneth Arrow, who was also a Nobel Prize winning economist. I don't know if he was at Harvard, but anyway. he. Uh, and the third one he refused to name because he's still alive. So he said, third one I, I will go unnamed. So three of us were called to the Vatican among many other experts. You know, the Vatican issues what are called encyclicals. That means uh, the Pope's message to the Catholic community and to the world community at large. And usually they're written in Latin. Um, so this was an encyclical about world pro poverty and how to deal with poverty and so on and so forth. John Paul II. And Professor Amartya Sen said, we have been consulted about it. And this third economist, who was going unnamed, he caught hold of the Pope and he said, um, Holy Father, you must write in that encyclical that capitalism is the only way. Free market economics is the only way and that you must put it in that encyclical. Pope has to say, if Pope says it's a big benefit. <laughs> uh, so that's the only way for welfare of humanity. Every other system has failed. And the Pope turned to that economist and caught hold of his hand and he said, you know, considering the unhappiness that has resulted from unchecked capitalism, uh, the unhappiness it has brought to humanity, I am sure the Almighty Lord in his compassion and wisdom will think of an alternative. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Professor Sen said, Kenneth Arrow was sitting there, uh, and there's some coffee table or something like that. He wrote on the back of the menu, menu Pope one, economist zero, and showed <laughs> like this. <laughs> And then he had a little addition to that story. He said uh, the encyclical was issued and actually uh, one of those paragraphs is written by me, uh, by Professor Amartya Sen. And he said that I always, ha uh, ha it's a source of solace to me. He said once if I go to the gates of heaven, I'm stopped. I will ask, I think St. Peter is at the gates of heaven. I'll ask St. Peter, look at your papers. Do you know who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> you have to let me in. <laughs> Cute story, but the, th the m point is that, yes, ethical, one must search for the ethical alternative. That, that's the, that was the idea. You don't have to be trapped by the trolley problem. Uh, it, one thing that showed me was you should not be trapped by theories or textbooks. You should follow your heart and see what, and don't be overawed by authority. 
They are not. We may be overawed at this stage. Oh, Harvard, I have a Nobel Prize winner. But the students, they are just the opposite. You know, nothing. You don't know anything. <laughs> and the things they say, they say to me, they, I hope, hope the professors don't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, asakto yacharan karma, that which is to be done, our duty, whatever that duty is, do it without attachment. The commentators say, do it as a worship of God. Ishwara aradhanartham. If you, have a, if you have a belief in God, devotion towards God, it becomes easier. Otherwise, detached action sounds so dry. <laughs> so what was started in the 47th verse, second chapter, and it shows the, the result of that, what, what happens, 17th and 19th verse, 18th verse, and the 19th verse, that same, what was said in the 47th verse is repeated. So how does one come to this state when you are above all action and inaction, when you realize you're delighting in the self, you are established in pure consciousness? That is the result. And how do you do that? Uh, uh, 19th verse just repeats whatever has been said so far. Param apnoti purusha, attains the highest. 20th verse. Karmanaiva hi san siddhim, Karmanaiva hi san siddhim, Astita janakadaya, Astita janakadaya, Loka sangrahame vapi, Loka sangrahame vapi, Sampashyan kartumar hasi, Sampashyan kartumar hasi. Sri Krishna is encouraging uh, Arjuna. Arjuna may have a doubt that I am a warrior and uh, what you are telling may apply to some monk or something but this doesn't apply to me. Then he says, look at the warriors in your own um, warrior class. There was King Janaka and others who are well known in our history that they attained perfection. Sansiddhim means perfection. They attained perfection through action alone. Karmanaeva. Through action alone they attain perfection. So you also do that. The way they did it you should do that. And even considering the welfare of the people, you should act. This is the second thing he says. Now, a couple of points here. One is, I must add or qualify what I said earlier. What did I say earlier? The pure consciousness, Atman, the reality, is beyond action and inaction. I said that earlier. Now I'm going to take it back. No, I'm not going to take it back. I'm saying it is beyond that, but also immanent in that. Action and inaction are nothing but the play of consciousness. I said pure consciousness is neither action nor near inaction. It's the witness of both. One. Second statement I'm making now. Both action and inaction are the play of consciousness. I'm, in Hindi it has more punch. I'm translating what a sadhu said. He says, Are Mahatma Ji, karma or akarma dono hi chaitan ka vilas hai. Chaitanya ka vilas hai. They are, vilas is a very beautiful word. It's like a divine play. Both are the divine play of consciousness. You are that pure consciousness which is expressed in your, in your activity, which is expressed in your meditation also. Which is expressed in your waking, in your dream, and your, in your deep sleep. In your walking and talking, and in your keeping si uh, silent and sitting. All of them are expressions of the same consciousness. Okay, this is point one. Point two. <coughs> the highest is attained through uh, action. This is troublesome for us. Us means non-dualists, Advaitins. Shankara is very clear about this. Action cannot take you to the highest. What can take you to the highest? Knowledge. So Shankara is very clear. What does action do? Action can do exactly what has been said earlier. It purifies your mind. Our, all our uh, impurities in the mind, our selfishness, our attachment, our hungering for sense pleasures, they are purified. Mind becomes clear and calm. And through meditation, that clear and calm mind is focused. And through that focused, clear and calm mind, if you listen to Vedanta, knowledge comes. I am the pure consciousness. Always was, am, always will be. That is real realization. But that realization comes not through the action. That comes through knowledge. And that knowledge comes through Vedanta. You have to come to class. Not go out and do good works in, in society there. That is useful as a preparation for coming to class. But ultimately knowledge is what, what gives us enlightenment. Even the word enlightenment means knowledge basically. 
So, when Krishna says, by action alone people reach perfection, you can immediately see Shankara going, oh, oh. <laughs> Krishna is messing things up. Slip of tongue. Because he's cutting out knowledge here. He says, by action alone one can reach uh, perfection. So what he does is, what is perfection? Perfection is the purity of the mind which prepares you for knowledge. So he adds, so karmana eva, by action alone, in his uh, commentary he adds, karmana eva, by action alone, sattva suddhi dwarena, by pu through the purification of mind, paramaapnoti, siddhim, perfection is attained. But he adds, inserts a clause, through the purification of the mind. So the purification of the mind is attained through action. Karma yoga gives you purity of mind. Bhakti yoga and Raja yoga give you concentration of mind. And through that pure and concentrated mind, Jnana yoga, the way of knowledge, gives you uh, enlightenment and liberation. That's his structure. And this verse does violence to his structure. So he's immediately up and ready to rep repair the damage done by Krishna. Why not? What is his, what's his problem? What's, what's Shankaracharya's problem? Why, why is he so... This is a very deep reason and very valid reason. If action leads to perfection, suppose you say perfection is not, um, not um, purification of mind. Here, clearly Krishna is talking about some siddhim means ultimate perfection. Realization, nirvana, moksha, whatever you call it. And he clearly says through action alone they attained perfection. Why can we not have that? So the answer from an Advaitic perspective is if it is through action then it must be something produced. What can action do? It can make something. It can unmake something. Shankaracharya says four things. Um, utpadya, it can produce. Uh, apya, you can attain something. Uh, you took the uh, train and came to this station and you attained the Vedanta society. You came here. That's also action. And then samskarya, you can repair something. It needs a coat of paint. You do something. It, it refines. Um, crude oil made into petroleum and so many products. A process of refinement. Action does that. And vikarya. You can change one thing into a, another. Milk is changed into yogurt, for example. So that's the classic example he uses. None of these will give you enlightenment and moksha. Because all of them are transformable. If you attain, he says, if you produce enlightenment, if you attain uh, the ultimate through work, then it can change again. That which was not and now has been produced by your effort, after some time it can go away. Inevitably, anything that is produced is subject to destruction. Anything that is, that is modified is subject to further modification. Anything that is refined is subject to deterioration. If you make yourself, if you attain moksha, you can lose it also. So then what's the difference about the path of knowledge? The path of knowledge just reveals to you that you are already free. Moksha is ever attained. You say by knowledge you attain moksha, by knowledge you attain uh, liberation. But what kind of knowledge is it? Knowledge that you are the Atman, you were always the Atman. You were always liberated. Right now you are also liberated, you just don't know it. Enlightenment is just knowing it. That which it exists eternally as the very nature of the Atman. What is the very nature of the Atman? Moksha, eternal liberation. And that's what you already have. We just do not know it. And the path of um, knowledge is to reveal that to us. And that moksha can never go away. Nobody can take it away from you. Shankaracharya says that moksha produced by karma is vinashya. It can be destroyed. It can be lost. You can attain freedom from the cycle of birth and death and then again come back again. What kind of freedom is that? Even further, Uttarakhand sadhus will say, I agree with them. They, they say, even the moksha attained by bhakti is also can be lost. And the sadhu said carefully, that be careful. I'm not saying it, it will be lost, but it can be lost. Why? Because it is given to you by God. That which is given by a superior power can also be withdrawn. Not in a bad way. What that sadhu said, if I narrate, you will immediately recognize it. He'd say, he said, suppose you, by your efforts you attain, and the grace of God, devotion to God, you attain moksha, liberation. You're not, no longer in the cycle of birth and death. But in a devotional path, you are ever in the blessed company of God. Now suddenly God takes it into his head, I'm going to be incarnated. 
I'm going as Krishna or Ramakrishna. And they say, hey, you, you and you, stop that meditation business. Come with me. We have to go to earth and, be <laughs> and do a lot of good to humanity. Yes, Vivekananda. Vivekananda was in meditation. And Sri Ramakrishna comes and says, will you not come with me? Humanity is suffering. And Vivekananda had to... <laughs> So the Uttarakhand Sadhu said the point he took away from it is, of course, the whole thing is very blessed. There's no harm coming to this enlightened person at all. They are liberated. But you may have to take a break from your meditation and come and <laughs> establish Vedanta societies and think, do things like that <laughs> in bhakti. But the Jnana Siddhanta is you are ever free. And that does not prevent you from working. That's the interesting thing. It does not prevent you from establishing Vedanta societies or doing good to the world or doing whatever. Because... All of this, even while doing all this action, even the enlightened are truly speaking ever free, uh, unenlightened, are truly speaking ever free. What to speak of the enlightened? Only that we do not know it, that's why we suffer. Those who know it do not suffer. They realize their own ever free self. Therefore, by action alone, if you attain moksha, Shankaracharya says, no, 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 no. Big problem. By action, attaining purification of mind, and then moksha. Now Shankara gives a nice explanation. He says, then what is the meaning of this verse? What, do, what is Krishna saying here? Three points he makes. First point. Janaka and others, having attained enlightenment, they kept on uh, in that, that state of perfection as Jivan Muktas, acting for the welfare of the world. They remained in action for the welfare of the world. That's perfectly acceptable to a non-duality. One. Or, he says, Arjuna, you may take it in this way, when Janaka was a spiritual seeker, uh, perfecting himself, he used the path of action to purify himself. And then reached perfection, that is enlightenment, through knowledge. Second. Third, you may say that, well, Janaka did action out of a sense of duty, he was not enlightened, but you may say that, now I have heard all the talks, I am enlightened, I need not do any action. Suppose Arjuna says that, he could be within his rights. That's what his, his argument is, I will not fight this stupid war. So, uh, suppose you say that. Then Krishna adds, Loka sangraha meva api sampashyan. Even then, if you think you are enlightened, you do not need this action at all. Even then, considering the welfare of the world, you need to do action. So these are the three points he makes. One more verse, and I am done. Why should I act? What is, it, what, what is my relationship to the welfare of the world? Suppose I don't want to do welfare of the world. And I suppose I want to sit, sit quietly. I'm, en I'm enlightened. I've realized I am pure consciousness. Let me enjoy it. Give me a break. <laughs> Why do I have to do action? What is the connection between my action and welfare of the world? Krishna says in the next verse. Yadyadacha rati shreshta Yadyadacha rati shreshta Tadda deveta rojana Tatta deveta rojana Sayat pramanam kurute Sayat pramanam kurute Locus tadanu vartate Locus tadanu vartate Whatever the superior person does, whatever your ideal does, that people follow. What that person sets as the standard of behavior, the masses follow that. And therefore, Arjuna, because you are a superior person. So a little bit of flattery. <laughs> He's sort of arguing him into a corner. Because you are a superior person, what you do, maybe you are enlightened, maybe you don't need action, but you need to do the right thing. Because if you do not do what is duty, others also will not do the duty. So others will have to. So you will be responsible for harming society. You must, you must set an example for society. It's so true. So true. Leaders, not just spiritual people. Of course spiritual teachers. We were reading in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount to his apostles, you will be the city on the hill, the light which cannot be hidden. Therefore, you have, he says, you have to be careful because people will look at you and learn from you. City on the hill is everybody can see. Light which cannot be hidden, you can see. And you are supposed to be a light to everybody. So spiritual teachers especially should be very careful about their activity. I remember once when a young monk left the order and our president at that time, Swami Bhuteshanji, is still so vivid. Remember, he's 98 years old and we're all surrounding him, all other monks. 
And this issue came up of this young monk who had left. Or he did something wrong and he had to be, um, he had to be uh, expelled from the order. Now the Swami was very unhappy. He said very, sat very quietly unhappy. And we all were around little commiserating, yes, yes, so bad, this too bad. And then he looked up and he said what he was unhappy about. He looked at the assembled monks, the senior monks all around him and he said, if we seniors do not set the example, this will be the result. So he's not unhappy because that monk left. That's also bad. But he's unhappy. He's showing his unhappiness at the senior monk. Warning them that don't think, oh, that person did something bad and he had to be expelled. What is your contribution to that? What example have you set for that person? Definitely spiritual teachers. But everybody else also. Teachers especially, in school, especially schools, colleges, universities, yes, but especially schools. Um, leaders. In fact, Shankaracharya in his commentary, when he says Shreshta, superior person, he says leader. Arjuna is a leader. A leader in your office, in your um, corporate office, wherever you're working. Um, whatever you say, I'm, I'm not a leader. You're a leader to your, even to your small section if you're looking, at, looking up to a particular part of the job. You're a leader there. You set an, act, you set an example by what you do. Parents. One of the toughest jobs where setting an example is absolutely necessary. As somebody joked, the one of the toughest jobs in the world, one of the most important jobs in the world for which no qualification is necessary, no, no training is necessary. Uh, not qualification is necessary, training is necessary. Unfortunately, without any training and without any qualification, people are parents. And they become, uh, they are in that position where they are what the children imitate. There's a saying in child psychology, children do not listen, they imitate. They imitate. And you've seen kids running around and the father and mother come and they say, tell the kids, do pranams to the Swami. The kid is running around here and there, jumping. And when they themselves come and do pranams, the kid also rushes. It's also a ga game to the kid. The child also rushes and does a pranam very quickly. <laughs> because it's if the parents are doing it, it's worth doing. Until a certain age, maybe 10 or 12, I don't know what it is now. <laughs> you are, parents are the heroes for the kids. After 13, you are zeros. So that, that's the, <laughs> then the friends are heroes. Up to 11 or 12, father, mother, teacher, especially teacher. So, there's so many funny sto uh, st stories about the influence of teachers. These are all silly school stories. You know, the school, English teacher at the school uh, would teach the students. And the father of that boy was an English teacher in the college. And he looked at the uh, notebooks of his child who was maybe 10 years old or less. And he says, net, N-E-T-T. -T. He said, no, this is wrong. Who taught you this? Uh, my teacher said so. He's wrong. It's N-E-T, not N-E-T-T. -T. You go and tell your teacher. And so he goes. I think many Indians know this story. It's very silly. So the boy goes back to school and he has written N-E-T. And the teacher said, how many times have to tell you? Net is N-E-T-T. -T. <laughs> then the little boy says, no, it isn't. How do you know? How dare you? Um, who told you that? It's, uh, it's N-E-T. Who told you that? My dad. Oh, your dad. What does your dad know? What does he do? Oh, he's an English teacher in the university. <laughs> the teacher says, uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> And then he says, well, your dad is right, but I'm right too. If you put one more T, the net becomes stronger, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Lead by example. They always say, lead by example. In, in the army, in their office, but at home too. And in the monastery too. Of course, it always doesn't work. <coughs> I'll share this little story with you. <laughs> Uh, I was a uh, novice and in one of the ashrams where there were little children in the, in the hostel, in the dorms. So one of the things was all the kids had to clean the dorms. Morning and evening they had to sweep. And some of the monks were very strict, so the kids were scared of them. I was not. They were never scared of me. <laughs> but the problem is that um, the uh, head Swami would, uh, um, I would incur the wrath of the head Swami because the dorm I was supposed to look after was not particularly clean. Others were spick and span and shiny. 
And they used to have a month, believe it or not, once a month, a neatness prize, which we never won. <laughs> and others won and cheered and, you know. And, but the kids were always on my side. So the kids, on the day when others would win the prize for neatness and we didn't, and the kids would say, that, um, Maharaj, that Swami or Maharaj, Maharaj, don't worry, they're consoling me. Don't worry. Those uh, other guys, you know, they weep 29 days a month and laugh on the last day. But we laugh 29 days a month. <laughs> <laughs> we weep on the 30th. So don't worry, we are happy. It's, we are okay with you. So one day I thought, I have to lead by example. So in the morning when the sweeping was supposed to be done, I pulled out the broomstick and started sweeping the dorm. And the kids, you know, they were sort of relaxing. And <laughs> then they looked at me. One by one they sat up and looked at me, what I was doing. I'm sweeping the dorm silently in, in, with a grim face. <laughs> and and it's sort of praise which says, so this is what it has come down to. Uh, and then one of the kids started clapping. And all the kids started <laughs> clapping. What happened? They said, this is the kind of warden we want. Hey, very good, go on. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> They're too cl clever for <laughs> that lead by example thing. <laughs> that is not going to fall into that trap. All right, do we have a question? Um, Karmana eva hi sansiddhi mastita janakadaya. And on the next one, yad yad acharati shreshta. Whatever the superior person does, that um, others imitate. Especially true in spiritual life, but uh, in, in uh, every other aspect also. And that's true for all of us. It's not just the guru or the CEO um, or the, the president of the university who has to do that. All down the ladder, all of us, we have to set an example. And it's a responsibility. Any, any comments, questions? Yes. Uh, Swamiji, about the, the, the difference between karma and, <clears throat> and knowledge or whatever, it's like, I mean, you learn by doing things. I mean, you, if you put your hand in the fire, it burns, and you don't do that anymore. So yes. wh what, what is the necessity of like, keeping it so separate? Like, you know yes. What I mean? yeah. um, you might say, what is the necessity of keeping these two separate? For example, we learn by doing things. That is true. Remember, there's only one kind of knowledge he's speaking about here. Knowledge of our true nature, which is permanent and unchanging. The rest is all true. In the world, of course, you have to read books, you have to go to the lab, you have to live life, then you know. As you said, you, you read that you shouldn't touch the fire. If you're wise, you learn. Not wise, otherwise, you actually touch the fire and you get a, and then you learn. Yes, by doing things we learn from the world, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but this is, he's talking about our real nature, which is, um, uh, which is finally learned uh, through removing the ignorance about it. So it has doing no, as no plays no part in it. It does. But at the lower levels. It's, there's nothing that you can do which will lead you to that enlightenment straight away. But it does help. A lot of doing has to be done at the karma yoga level. A lot of doing has to be done at the bhakti yoga and raja yoga level. At subtler and subtler levels. All that has to be done. If we do not do our bit at the, at the level of karma yoga. Swami Ashokananda ji used to um, you know, he would say humorously, uh, he would emphasize that karma yoga in the ashram. Swami Ashokananda was in the Vedanta Society of, Society of uh, Northern California in San Francisco. He would emphasize, he would, his talks were all about Advaita. But the disciples, he would say, work, work and work. Uh, now, he says, you may think that the Swami doesn't think I am ready for meditation. That's why he's telling me to do karma yoga. I will show him. And indeed, you will show me, but not in the way you thought. <laughs> yeah. So action, certainly action is important. Action, Sri Ramakrishna puts it very beautifully. In the Gospel of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, he says, action is the first karma. He says, karma is the first chapter in spiritual life. In the book of spiritual life, karma is the first chapter. It begins with karma. First, from unethical action to ethical action. Clean up your house. Then from ethical action to unselfish action. That's one step further. Because ethical action can also be selfish. I'm doing nothing wrong. I'm doing the right thing. But it's for myself. And for me and mine. Then you go become wider. 
it's for everybody. Certainly ethical, but also unselfish. So we go from step by step by step. From adharma to dharma, from dharma to karma yoga. What you said about learning through action. There is this famous uh, saying about philosophy. Um, why, why, why do we need philosophy at all? The famous saying, I think Socrates or Plato, an unexamined life is not worth living. Who was that, Socrates or Plato? Socrates, an unexamined, that's taken as the classic, um, unique selling point for philosophy. Why do we need philosophy at all? An unexamined life is not worth living. Unless you know what you're doing, what are you doing it for? What's the point of it all? What's, it, what's the point of doing these things? So unexamined life is not worth living. So that was, for hundreds of years, that was the selling point of philosophy. Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, the existentialist, Sartre, he, he challenged it. He said, an unlived life is not worth examining. That's very existentialist and very French. <laughs> yeah. So action has its place, but what Shankara is saying, by doing things, um, you may prepare yourself, but ultimately enlightenment is a matter of knowing or not knowing. And that knowing is helped by doing, but it cannot be produced by action itself. Also remember the reason that separation was there, there's a particular context specific to Shankara. He is interpreting the Upanishads. He's writing commentaries on Upanishads, which is Vedanta, basically. But the Upanishads are embedded in the Vedas. And other than the Upanishads, the rest of the Vedas are concerned with action. So in order to distinguish the Upanishads sharply from the other ritualistic portion of the Vedas, which were concerned with fire rituals and yajna and all of that, so he had to make this sharp distinction. Yeah. I remember in his... The first line to the Isho Upanishad, the uh, Isho Upanishad, the first line, the commentary is, uh, the first line when Shankaracharya starts his commentary in the Isho Upanishad, the first line is, Isha Vasya Mityadeo Mantra Na Karma Suvini Yuktaha. These mantras which are starting now, the Isho Upanishad, Isha Vasya Mit, uh, Idagam Sarvam, these mantras have no connection to karma. That's the first thing he, he, he thinks worth saying. He's picking a quarrel with the ritualists. When he begins the commentary, his first line is, he's starting with a quarrel. To the ritualist, the Vedic ritualist, he says, what is coming now does not belong to you. And it's a radical thing to say, because the Ishavasya Upanishad is the 40th chapter of the Shukla Yajur Veda Sanghita. It's a, imagine a book, 40 chapters. Suddenly this guy Shankara turns up, and he tears out the 40th chapter from your book, and he says, 39 chapters belong to you, but the 40th chapter is mine. And so it le leads to fierce debates. So you can see why he's, he wants to be very clear about this. Because um, there are other teachers who will say, by doing these rituals you will reach enlightenment. He doesn't want to say no outright. Because if he dismisses all of that outright, remember his own Upanishad also forms part of that book. If he dismisses those 39 chapters, then who is to say the 40th chapter is, also not, is, is right? That could also be wrong. So he has to say, that's also right, but it has nothing to do with this. That's good for giving you what you want in this world and in heaven. And if you do it dispassionately, without attachment, all those actions are good for preparing you for the 40th chapter, which is what I'm going to talk about. So that's it. Good question. Oh, your two questions here. There and here. Yes. Uh, what, what is the difference between chanting Vedic mantras and doing japa? Oh. Because Vedic chanting also is said to be it leads, leads to enlightenment. Um, so so Vedic chanting is a little restricted because uh, there, are, um, there are certain ways of doing it. So traditionally um, a person would be invested with the sacred thread and then initiated into Vedic studies and there's a particular way of chanting those mantras which, were, which are taught. So if you know it, there's a person here, I don't want to take his name, he'll feel embarrassed, but he knows how to do it. Uh, so those people who are taught, they can do it. Without being taught, it is generally recommended that don't chant Vedic mantras. That's the general idea. But Japa, once you've got the uh, mantra from the Guru, or even if you've not got a mantra from the Guru, some, a standard mantra like Om Namah Shivaya, 
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. These things can be chanted by yourself. There's no particular method or tune to do that. If you're initiated by a guru, guru gives you a method and a mantra. Japa is somewhat of a later practice. Vedic mantras are more ancient than that. Uh, they were chanted according to a certain system for the production of certain results. B need not be spiritual results. Could be worldly or heavenly results also. That was called Karma Kanda. So it was part of a whole structure of Vedic society. Now we don't really belong to that. Uh, I mean, society has changed so much, even in India, has changed so much. Uh, of course, Vedic chanting has been kept alive by uh, Brahmins from uh, ancient times. But the major, but Japa is something that everybody can do. Everybody, uh, uh, they can do it. And Japa is usually used, so both are used for both worldly purposes and for spiritual purposes. Here we are concerned only for the spiritual purpose. So this is one difference, that Vedic uh, mantra chanting is a little restricted. There are certain systemic requirements which are required. But Japa is for everybody. Yes, microphone here. That will be the last question. Okay, so I'm in college and I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. So with regards to duty, you might understand why I'm asking this kind of question. If I don't want to be fueled by my likes and dislikes and satisfying selfish desires, how do I know what duties I want to choose to fulfill with my life or accept upon myself? Yes, so I'm in college too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a good, good, good time to think about it. One is what's right in front of you. So you're in college. Um, right in front of you is w what you can take from college, what you can study and learn and develop yourself. It's a wonderful opportunity. So use that to the best. Uh, don't let let yourself be diverted by the hundred and one diversions so easily available today. I mean, I was amazed to see how studying has changed. I watch these in, uh, incredibly smart kids, and you know, uh, sometimes I can see what they're doing. They're sitting in front of me, and the way people study these days is maybe, maybe I'm out of touch, but uh, some of you may know about it. So the student, she is listening to the professor, taking notes, answering texts, uh, chatting on Facebook, <laughs> looking up some things which the professor is saying on Google, checking up on the professor what is, and all of it's going on at the same time. <laughs> so this is a new mode of engagement. But anyway, so that's one thing. Um, right in front of you is study. But the traditional things, you know, make yourself useful to society, um, look after your brothers and sisters and parents. These may sound old fashioned, but these are duties too because they're in front of you. They are there as we grow older, we take responsibility for others. A good indicator is follow your own highest ideal of all the things that seem good to you. Could be anything. As he says, your ideal. People follow their, follow their ideal. And it's a, ideal is a whole range. Film stars, sports stars, ideals. And uh, you will see people change their, their hairstyle and their dress according to whomever they like at that moment. Rock stars. Now, own highest. It must be something that appeals to you. But also among all the things that appeal to you, it also must be something that's noble. And so how do I know noble? What feels big to you, vast to you? You know, like ideal, youth are idealistic in uh, earlier times and even today also, it's very natural. So what feels idealistic to you? What feels good to you? One good indicator is of something idealistic, of ideal, is that it will benefit others also, not just you. You will find something that is and we, if you do it, it'll do good to you, but it'll do good to a lot of others. That's a good sign of, a, of an ideal. I'm leaving it vague because, and your own ideal can, be, can change. You, are, you pursue something wholeheartedly for some time, and after five years you find, um, I'd rather do something else. Good, very good. But at every time we must be able to answer this question. What is your dream? What is it that you're pursuing? then we are living a consciously directed life. Duty sometimes sounds so boring and old, and <laughs> but I remember, I'll end with this. Swami Vivekananda said, the ideals of India are 
renunciation and service in tag and tapasya renunciation and service now if you tell this to modern indian youth it sounds so boring renunciation why should i renounce in service why should i do service why should i do any good to any i'll serve myself so it sounds boring um a, a person i know who is who is by profession a management consultant but a very great admirer of swami vivekananda and it's basically he's a philosopher wonderful srinivas venkatram the same thing he rephrased in such a way that it immediately became attractive to young people he said instead of saying renunciation and service we say a passionate commitment to a higher ideal that's renunciation <laughs> and what do you mean yes when you are passionately committed to a higher ideal everything else falls away automatically you don't have to renounce when you're chasing something high it demands all of your time and energy all the silliness of life in the superficial it is fall away automatically renunciation is automatic you don't have to do it and the second thing service he says uh, a commitment to the evolutionary potential of all beings <laughs> what is that that i seriously believe everybody can be better than they are physically morally emotionally intellectually socially everybody can do a little better i believe that and i would like to help young people are, wow this is great yes this is this is my life i want to do this same renunciation and service <laughs> om shanti 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 he hari he om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namaste